have been much better than last year for most of us. Um, January 17th, as you know, is my last Sunday in uh, the pulpit. Please watch the parish news and the emails for information on uh, when I have a farewell on God's feet and just an opportunity for us to give thanks for our time together. Uh, as we move towards that, uh, Pastor Pryor and Pastor Bob and I have been making arrangements so that uh, in February, as long as uh, there are no more lingering shutdowns, we can officially start uh, confirmation and first communion for the year. So uh, look for details concerning that in the weeks ahead as we get back to that. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to have a majority of those meetings in person here in the sanctuary, socially distanced, uh, but we'll have more details in the weeks ahead. Um, Christmas officially comes to an end this Wednesday with the epiphany of our Lord, known in some cultures as Little Christmas, uh, the visit of the wise men, and that is always January 6th, and so our Wednesday night service at 7 p.m. will mark that. Uh, and uh, we will celebrate the visit of the three kings, the Magi from afar. Uh, so you can either join us in person at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary or virtually as we'll send that out right after the service is over. Today is the second Sunday of Christmas, the 10th day of Christmas. And we continue to bask in that glory of the newborn king. So let us take a moment of silent prayer and then we'll rise and join together in the gathering on page 2 of the service folder. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. God of goodness and loving kindness, we confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. We have turned away from your invitation to new life. We have turned away from the lowly and downtrodden. In your abundant mercy, forgive us our sins, those we know and those known only to you, for the sake of the one who came to live among us, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Beloved, hear the good news of peace and salvation. God forgives us all our sins, not through our own work, but through Jesus Christ, made known to all people. With all who come to the manger, rejoice in this amazing gift of grace. Amen. Shall come 
and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them by I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd and a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he bestowed on us in the Beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, in Christ. We have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Him. 
But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one ever has seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. As Puritans and British colonists made their way to North America in the 16th and the 17th centuries, they began to put away many of the traditions and not bring with them many of the customs that they had known back in England. This was intentional as they wanted to begin this new life, this new direction that would lead to so many possibilities for them and they wanted to form their own customs and their own traditions. So one of the things that went out the window as they established themselves in the new land would, would become America were all the trappings and all the extra parts that mark the celebration of Christmas. So many of the things we see today, the greenery, the trees, the, the carols, and all the other things that we so love and, and enlighten the season was something that in the early days of America just wasn't there. And the reason behind that is that they didn't want anything to get in the way of their opportunity to connect to the real reason behind the celebration of Christmas. This gift of God's love born in the baby at manger. And so that would be the focus. That would be the emphasis of Christmas, not to lose sight of what the gift was all about. Well, it only lasted so long, so by the 1800s, especially in the aftermath of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, by the 1840s, many of those things, those beloved traditions and customs that are the extra stuff with Christmas, work their way into America and into the customs of the people. But at the heart of the motivation was that focus. Stay focused on Jesus. Don't get caught up in all of the other stuff. Today is the second Sunday of Christmas, and we don't always every year have the opportunity to get to the second Sunday of Christmas because of the way the 12 days of Christmas fall, where they fall in the weekly calendar, affects whether or not we get this second Sunday. But the second Sunday of Christmas, especially this year, offers us this beautiful Gospel of John, which is God, John the Gospel writer's Christmas story. But as we read it and as we hear it, we find it doesn't sound very Christmassy at all, right? It's not at all like the other stories that we hear from the synoptic Gospels, the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic means same scene Gospels. They follow the same pattern of the stories, and they tell basically the same perspective uh, stories from different perspectives. And so in the synoptic Gospels, the first three, we hear about the angel Gabriel. We hear about the nativity and the manger with the animals and the straw and everything else. But John's Gospel doesn't sound anything like that, does it? But John's gospel that we hear today is indeed John's Christmas story. Most biblical scholars will, will argue that John's gospel was the last of the four gospels to be written. So John already knew that the traditional Christmas story was already out there. And many other the other stories that we hear about in the Gospels that report things from Jesus' life. So John, when he was inspired by God's Spirit to put that pen to paper, to write the words that would endure, John seeks to come at it from a different perspective. And John's Christmas story that we hear today is a deeply and powerful theological presentation of Christmas. 
And it connects a lot of dots leading up to Christmas so it can answer the question, why? Why this gift of Christmas is so important? Why this celebration of the baby in the manger in Bethlehem is so vital and important in the lives of the people? So John begins his gospel in a way that echoes how the Bible itself begins. Remember, as the Bible begins, as we hear the recording of the creation account, we hear, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we hear the way by which God creates the heavens and the earth is God says, let there be, and those things from the seven periods of creation come into existence by the power of God's word. And we hear also as we read that first chapter of Genesis that the spirit of God is hovering over the waters. So the idea presented even in those early days of the Old Testament is that all three aspects of God, as we know as Christians, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all there in the act of creation. So listen again to how John begins his Christmas story. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. An intentional connection. Because as John is telling of the joy of Christmas, he wants the people of God to see and understand that this gift in the manger this presentation of the Savior, the Messiah, the long-awaited one who was going to come and fix what was broken, wasn't a new thing that was happening, that this wasn't just the beginning of the second person of the Trinity that we know as Jesus, but that person, that aspect, that character of God was there in the beginning, in creation, and acted and was part of making the beauty of the creation that we have today. So in essence, the reason that God would be so moved to come into the creation, into the flesh, to do that work of salvation is because God is in the DNA and the design of creation from the beginning. And the idea is that Jesus was the one actually doing the work of creation. As God said, let there be God's word is Jesus. And so it's a deep, deep theological concept. But the idea is to show why it was so important for God to fix what became broken by sin, that God is in the creation. God designed it, God loves it, and God cares for it. So when the darkness appeared, God would bring that light. So John goes on, what has come into being in him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And then John moves a little further to the actual moment of Christmas. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. There it is. In the midst of the darkness, the things that interrupt creation, those things that interrupt the peace and the goodness of our lives, into that darkness, God came into the flesh to be the light of hope, to be the light that would shine in the darkness and fix what was destroyed and broken by sin and all the effects that it brings. And John's simple desire in this presentation, this different approach to Christmas is to not get caught up in all the other trappings, not to focus on the details of the manger and the angel and the hay and the animals and all those things, but to focus on the heart of God. That no matter what, even in the midst of a world broken by sin and viruses and the darkness that clouds life, God has come to be present and is life and light for us all. So now we are winding down Christmas again. The season is coming to a close. 
And I don't want to go through my annual rant again, but we see it happening. There are fewer and fewer lights going on in the neighborhoods. We're seeing trees on the, on the curb ready to be thrown out. But even though Christmas is coming to a close, what is at the heart of the hope that is the message and the true gift of Christmas never comes to an end. That's the point for us as the people of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us to be light in the darkness. And we, as God's people, gather together in that Word that has become flesh. Every single time we gather and we hear the scriptures proclaimed, sung, read, however they come to us, it is Jesus and Jesus' presence, the Word becoming flesh and coming near to us. And we have that blessed privilege and opportunity as the people of God all throughout the year to actually receive that flesh and blood of our Savior that came into the manger as we received the blessed sacrament. And there is that gift and assurance, the message of Christmas, the message that John was trying to proclaim, that we as God's people always have God's presence with us. So as Christians, for us, we celebrate Christmas throughout the year. Amen.
In our prayers this morning, we remember Linda Burns, who will be undergoing surgery this week. We also remember Arlene Taus, uh, who will be undergoing minor surgery at St. Francis Hospital. Joining our voices with the song of the angels, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Redeeming God, you gather together your people from the farthest parts of the earth. Protect your church from stumbling. Let it not be overcome by sorrow, division, or despair. Make us radiant with goodness, that we might live always to the praise of your glory. Hear us, O God. You bring together heaven and earth. All creation testifies to your splendor. All the ecosystems of this earth in delicate balance, from coastlands to farmlands, forests to wetlands, deserts to rainforests. Show us new ways to live in harmony with the world around us. Hear us, O God. You overflow with grace upon grace. Expand the imaginations of those who serve in positions of authority. Open their hearts to the needs of their nations and communities. Protect all, of, all those in harm's way and those risking danger for the sake of others. Hear us, O God. You bring sorrow to those who weep. Embrace those who feel far off, excluded or defeated. Accompany those living with chronic and invisible illness. Sustain the weak and the weary. Refresh those who labor under the weight of pain or sickness. We remember especially Arlene, Linda, Evelyn, Cecile, Tyler, Kyle, Jonathan, Mackenzie, Madeline, Brett, Anne, Jan, Melissa, Claire, Carol, Violet, Robert, Roy, June, Bill, Karen, Carl, Carla, Kevin, Paul, Bob, Mitch, Chloe, Don, Jack, Linda, Andy, Barbara, Paul, Joanne, and all those we now name before you in our hearts. Hear us, O God. You come to us in the beauty of darkness and of light. Bring justice and reconciliation to communities divided by oppressions and misuse of power. Guide us to speak holy words of advocacy and truth. Help us to honor your image in one another. Hear us, O God. You turn our mourning into joy. We give thanks to those who have died in the faith. With all the saints, give us our inheritance in Christ in the fullness of time. Gather us all together into your mercy. Hear us, O God. God of all mercy, come quickly to us with grace upon grace as we lift these and all of our prayers to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Moses and set him over the whole world to serve you, his creator, and to rule over all creatures. Even when he disobeyed you and lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the power of death, but helped all men to seek and find you. Again and again you offered a covenant to men, and through the prophets taught him to hope for salvation. Father, you so loved the world, that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. He was conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, a man like us in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, and to those in sorrow joy. In fulfillment of your will, he gave himself up to death, but by rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him. He sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as his first gift to those who believe, to complete his work on earth and to bring us the fullness of grace. Father, may this Holy Spirit sanctify these offerings. Let them become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, as we celebrate the great mystery which he has left us, as an everlasting punishment. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, by your first cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Savior of the world. For God has loved us so much that he has given us his Son to be our Savior. And now, therefore, as God's beloved children, we have the courage to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 